Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Better Buildings Alliance Plug and Process Loads team webinar. I'm Dr. Kim Trenbath. I'm the technical lead for the PPL team. And welcome to the webinar. We have a great lineup for you today. Next slide. So here's a picture of the team members from NREL um, who are part of the PPL technology research team. I'm at the top. I'm Dr. Kim Trenbath, and I work at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Golden, Colorado. My colleagues at NREL include Amy Labar, Robin Tuttle, and our intern, Christy Maisha. If you want to contact us or if you have any questions about the team, the webinars, or resources that we have, uh, please feel free to email us at ppl at nrel.gov. And you can also contact me. Um, my net, my um, email and my phone are up there at the top. Next. All right, well, we have a great um, presentation for everyone today. We're going to be featuring the Houston Advanced Research Center, and they're going to be talking about uh, getting to net zero energy through strategic building operations and plug load management. Before we go into their presentation, I'm going to give an update on the BBA PPL team. Um, and after their presentation, we'll have some time for question and answers. And at the end, if we have some time and some volunteers, we'll have some member updates. So I'll talk about a few um, logistical items right now. At any time during the presentation, if you want to type in a question, feel free to do that in the question section on your GoToMeeting panel. These questions can be directed um, for the presenters today from Park, or if they're directed to me, I will answer those during the Q&A session. So please, please, please enter your questions. We're looking forward to a good discussion. Um, we'll be compiling those and answering as them, um, answering as many of them as we can. During the member update section, if you would like to provide an update, please raise your hand. I will see that your hand is raised. I will call on you and we will un request that you unmute your line to provide your update. Um, you can also put in to the questions that you would like to provide an update if you don't want to wait until the end. And I will call on the mem I'll call on you for your member update. All right, next slide. Okay, the first thing on the agenda is our PPL team update. Next slide. Well, we've been busy over the past year on many resources that will be helpful to building owners, especially with um, strategies and technologies that will help you control your plug loads. As you all know, plug and process loads make up 47% of whole building energy use in commercial buildings, and that's a lot. And so in order to get to zero carbon by 2050, it is very important that we control our plug loads and process loads. When we talk about plug loads, we're talking about plug-in um, plug and hardwired devices that are not part of any other building end use, such as lighting, um, HVAC, um, or refrigeration. And when we're talking about process loads, we're talking about process um, loads that do processes in a building, such as um, cooking and vertical transportation. So we have lots of resources available to you on our website. Um, the website is seen in green at the top. Um, the resources include guides for assessing and reducing plug loads. I'll talk about those later. We also have fact sheets. Um, an example of a fact sheet would be information on how to disaggregate your plug loads in your building. So disaggregating them down to what types of plug loads are in your building, such as how much of your load is um, attributed to computers um, or um, microwaves or the refrigerators. That fact sheet is available in our resources. Brand new, we have utility incentives. We also have recorded webinars um, that you can watch on demand. And then we also have case studies. Case studies feature buildings who've um, implemented plug load strategies in the past, and they talk about their successes and their best practices. Next slide. So one of the feature um, resources that we have is 
two documents on assessing and reducing plug and process loads in your buildings. And the two guides that we feature here are the retail um, sector guide and the office building sector guide. So you can access those at the links at the bottom. I've talked about this before, but in general, these not only cover technologies that will help you um, reduce your plug loads, but also strategies that you can incorporate to make sure that your technologies are, are a success. This includes designating a PPL champion, someone to oversee the entire process of plug load control in your building, institutionalizing your PPL reduction practices, so putting these into processes and formal policies in your organization, um, establishing the business case for PPL reduction. So this is working with your upper management and your senior management to show why it's important to reduce your plug loads. This is um, economical as well as for some non-energy benefits such as um, um, using smart outlets for asset management. And then finally, you want to educate your employees on the benefits of plug load control. This gets buy-in across the organization and so that they so that your um, employees and your occupants understand what's going on um, with plug loads um, and the technologies that you've implemented to control them. Your control technologies include um, advanced power strips, automatic receptacle controls, smart outlets or wireless meter and control systems, which I'll talk about in a second, and integrated controls. Integrating the control of your plug loads with other building end uses, such as your lighting um, control system or your building automation system. Next slide. So I referred to this earlier, but this is our smart outlet fact sheet that's available on our website. So smart outlets are wireless meter and control systems, and they meter the plug load as well as turn off and on the power that goes to the plug that's plugged into them. So in this um, fact sheet, in, you can see at the bottom left corner of it, there's an example of a smart outlet. And these outlets can be plug in, plug in or built into the wall. This smart outlet fact sheet tells you what smart outlets are, how to procure them, and some best practices for using them. And you can access this again on our website. Next slide. This is an example of a fact sheet that we have. We wrote an ACEEE summer study conference proceeding paper um, on emerging technologies for improved plug load management systems. And we have a one page fact sheet that highlights the two emerging, emerging technologies. One is learning behavior algorithms, using learning behavior algorithms, machine learning and learning behavior, behavior algorithms um, to automatically determine a per, an occupant's behavior and adjust the plug load schedule accordingly. And then the other one is automatic and dynamic load detection. This is a plug and play system for smart outlets. So this, smart, this is again found on our website. Next. We have a utility incentive list that we keep updating um, over the years. Um, yeah, this is like our ninth year of updating it. And in this utility incentive list, um, we have about 500 utility incentives that are um, related to plug and process loads. Uh, they come from 144 utilities. This is an Excel spreadsheet that you can download from our website, and you can filter this by your state, your incentive sponsor, or the type of incentive that you're looking for. So check it out today. Next. And you can access all of our webinars on demand from the BBA um, website. You can go to the link from our website that says watch now. It's on the front page of our website. You can access this a couple of days after we'll um, after after today, and you can access the most recent one that we per, we um, did in March of 2021 on beyond energy efficiency, how your device usage patterns affect energy consumption. Next, okay, so that's all the updates that I have um, 
If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at ppl at nrel.gov. Next. So I'm pleased to introduce our guest present presenters for today. They are from the Houston Advanced Research Center. We have three presenters and I will read their bios and then after that, turn it over to them. So our first presenter is Dr. Mustafa Beydoun. He is the Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Houston Advanced Research Center, or HARC. He is responsible for directing, administering, and coordinating the operations of HARC, including its LEED Platinum Zero Energy Headquarter Building, in support of the organization's strategic and administrative goals. Dr. Beydoun's research interests are in the areas of air quality, vehicle emissions and electrification, and industrial development. Dr. Gavin Dillingham is the Director for Clean Energy Policy and the Director of the U.S. Department of Energy's South Central and Upper West Combined Heat and Power Technical Assistance Partnership. Dr. Dillingham leads multi-stakeholder efforts focusing on policy programs to improve the climate resilience of power infrastructure and built environment and to help usher in the energy transition via a variety of clean energy and energy efficiency initiatives. Dr. Carlos Gamara is a senior research scientist with HARC and the energy manager of the HARC's headquarters building. His research is focused on community energy systems, decarbonization, and strategies to model and mitigate climate risk associated with the energy infrastructure and the built environment. Before I turn it over to the team from HARC, I want to remind you, if you have any questions, please, again, type them into the question box, and we will answer them during the question and answer section. Take it away. Well, th th thank you, Kim. Appreciate it. I'll, I'll get the presentation started by giving you an overview of what we'll be talking about and then hand it over to Carlos and Gavin. Uh, next slide, please. So, so I'll discuss uh, HARC as an organization, our building, also look at uh, some of our energy management uh, uh, ideas at HARC and what we're doing. Uh, Carlos will take a look at some of the load, load management issues along with Gavin, along with what we experienced before COVID and after COVID, and, and then hopefully have plenty of time for some of your questions and answers. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So HARC's a sustainability research organization. We're a uh, applied uh, non-advocacy uh, organization, and most of our research focuses on air quality, energy, uh, water resources, and climate risk. And as you can imagine, a lot of that is based on a strong geospatial and analytics foundation. So we, we work with everybody from our, our, our funders, which include the federal government, state and local entities, and uh, foundations and, and even some some corporate interests to to our nonprofit partners and certainly our academic partners and and, and partners in in consulting as well. Uh, next slide, please. Our uh, our, our our lead platinum building is, is what we'll be talking to you about uh, today. Uh, it was uh, constructed and, and we moved it in March of 2017. It's about 20,000 square feet. Uh, it was certified LEED Platinum in September of 2017, and we were certified as uh, zero energy by the International Living Futures Institute uh, just last March. Uh, it, it's, it's a very unique building uh, in that we, we have not just 252 solar panels on the roof, which produce about 90 kilowatts of power, but we also have uh, uh, 36 geothermal wells under the parking lot, which are responsible for the heat exchange for our uh, HVAC system. And we have an extremely tight building envelope, which has an effective R value of 50. Uh, so it, it's really the, the solar, the building envelope, and, and, uh, and of course the HVAC on top of how we're operating the building that's really allowed us to increase the efficiency even further and, and, and uh, certainly achieve, achieve zero energy certification. Uh, we're at Energy Star 99 right now, which means we're one of the 10 most efficient buildings in the state of Texas. Uh, we, we were bumped up to 100 before COVID, but because of some occupancy restrictions, they they, they ended up knocking us back down to, to 99. Next slide, please. We've received quite a few awards of distinction with respect to the building. Uh, there are here for you to, to, to certainly look at. Uh, I'd like to highlight a couple of them. One is the Apex Award, which we received, I think, in 2018. Uh, it's for general contractors, and, and we were... 
uh, we, we were the, the winner for the category under $20 million. And, and I think we actually received the highest score of any submittal in the whole region, uh, in, the, in the whole Texas, Louisiana region that year. Uh, we were recognized by the Urban Land Institute uh, Houston chapter in 2019 uh, for an award of distinction. And, and then in 2019, we, we also received the U.S. Green Building Council's Texas chapter uh, Project of the Year Award. Next, next slide, please. This is, uh, this is what we want to do with the building in terms of where we are and, and where we want to go. Uh, we've obviously received uh, the, the platinum certification soon after moving in. We are now the uh, first operational at zero office building in Texas, but we do have plans for, for other things and other enhancements such as energy storage uh, on site and a micro grid so we can really island and demonstrate uh, the benefits of that. Uh, and we do uh, want to look at transform, transforming a smart building into an intelligent building through additional sensors and, and monitors that, that allow us to optimize the building in real time on the fly, so to speak, rather than after the fact, after we've analyzed the data. And, and we are looking at, at other uh, initiatives on the water side and the carbon side as well. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. This is our building dashboard uh, that, that's accessible in the building uh, that, that essentially shows you real-time data from our uh, solar array, uh, both hourly in real-time, but over the, the pre previous week. And then it also shows you uh, uh, energy consumption from the grid and from uh, from, from, from our array and also where that energy is going. We're actually, this is a little dated, we're actually at 99, of course, Energy Star now. And, and post COVID, we've been at probably 156, 157 solar energy renewable ratio, and meaning that we're producing about 57% more power from our solar array than we're consuming uh, over the course of the year from the building. Next slide, please. This is our internal building dashboard, which shows everything from air, air quality monitors to uh, to the substations that monitor our overall plug load, uh, the, the the loads going to lighting and uh, the elevator and uh, HVAC and some of these other systems as well. Next slide, please. We use a very innovative uh, power strip management system. Uh, it's developed by an entity called Sapient. And, and Carlos will talk to, uh, more about this in a bit, but, but it really allows us to monitor everything by floor. We have a two-story two building, monitors uh, things by, by, by the individual office and even by the equipment in every office uh, or, or in the building as a whole. So, so, so we have numbers on what the monitors are using in real time in the, buildings, uh, in the building as we speak, what the desktop computers are using, what, what, what the auxiliary lamps in every office are consuming as well. And the beauty of the system is it, it not only gives us data, it also allows us to turn individual plugs on and off. So, for example, if we know that uh, uh, you know plugs one and two in this office are, are are dedicated to monitors, we can turn those plugs off, you know, on a Friday morning at two o'clock in the morning because nobody's going to be using that office at that time. For example. Uh, next slide, please. So, once again, I did discuss some of these issues, but uh, but, but but just to highlight some of the numbers, over the last 12 months, we have generated about 105,000 kilowatt hours uh, off of our solar array. Uh, energy consumption has been improved. We moved into a building that was already LEED Platinum very efficient, but we've been able to squeeze an extra 20% from that building because of the great work Carlos and team have done and, 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 and you know, and our, and our workers and our employees and staff as well supporting those efforts and, and kind of buying into what we want to do with the building. We are at Energy Star 99 and once again, we, we, we are uh, certified as, as net zero uh, energy by ILFI. Uh, next slide, please. And you know, I, I, I like to tell people we haven't paid a bill at Hark, a, a utility bill at Hark, uh, in, in two years. And it's not because we don't pay our bills; we do. It's, it's simply because we haven't been billed by the utility. Uh, this is a running average of uh, our, our electric bills over the first uh, over the previous 12 months. Uh, and 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 the, and you can see uh, when we first moved into the building, our electric bill was just over $10,500. In 2018, it was $9,400. In 2019, and, and our solar array expanded from 36 panels to 252 panels in December of 2018. So that's why you have the marked drop in 2019 was $101. And then in 2020, we, we actually got, got back $913 from our utility. And over the last 12 months, it's been over $1,000. So it's, it, it's nice in that, uh, you know, it doesn't cost us anything to keep the lights on essentially in the building. And, and the credits we get back from our electric utility more than pay for our $40, $50 a month water bills. Next slide, please. Carlos. Uh, 
It's all yours. Thank you very much, Mustafa. Uh, so we are going to be talking now about the process we we are const continuously running on how to on the plug load optimization. So next slide, please. But we would like to start giving a quick overview of the energy consumption in the building. As Mustafa uh, highlighted before, we first occupied the building in 2017. So uh, as we can see in this slide, we've been through different stages energy-wise. Uh, the we we can see the pre-optimization energy consumption, which was uh, slightly over 20 kbtus per square foot. Then, uh, as I will mention later, we started an energy audit in the second half of 2018 that led us to this optimization process that finished around uh, November 2019, where we can see the, our energy consumption is again stabilized. But then, uh, you know, everybody knows what happened at the beginning of 2020. And when COVID uh, arrived to the US, we just uh, tried to take advantage of the situation to keep up improving the energy performance of our building. And at this point, we are starting to see our energy consumption at the building level going up again as more more people more staff members are moving into the building working from the building so i just wanted to highlight these four situations to put us in context of how 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 have we been operating the building during these last four years next slide please the first step we we in in this optimization process was to uh to develop a building energy audit for the whole building during the second half of 2018. Mainly, this building was covering uh, three uses, three energy uses, HVAC, lighting, and plug loads. So we basically studied the individual consumption of plug loads with some portable meters and the plug load submitter. Uh, in the results of this audit was, were, were very interesting. We learned where energy was used at the plug load level, and we also defined some conservation measures, basically the, that low hanging fruit that we could easily pick, like improving the schedule of the coffee makers and water dispensers that at the time were working almost 24 seven. But we also learned that we have two coffee makers that each of them was were consuming uh, 6,100 watts while brewing coffee and 125 watts on a standby mode. So basically we have very big coffee makers and uh, we decided to turn off one and, and keep one working and it was more than enough for, for us for the size of our company we also encouraged the staff members to turn off their computers at night most people was not doing it uh, it's interesting and i want to highlight that to see the kind of conversations we've been going through we got immediate pushback from our it department saying that usually software updates were run at night so that might put some computers at risk uh, but finally, having these conversations, we managed to agree with the uh, IT on pushing software updates on some specific dates, so, so we still could benefit from the energy savings and have the, the computers uh, safe. But still, after doing this initial energy audit, we, we continue seeing an increase on plug loads consumption during 2019, so we didn't know why. To be honest, we don't know why, and we keep on researching, keep on talking, and until we realized that there was there was new equipment installed, new equipment was being installed in the building without us knowing. So it was kind of an eye-opening question, an eye-opening issue for us, and we decided what again we need we had to sit down and define some strategies uh, for the following months. Next slide, please. These are the challenges we identified at that point. So uh, for us, it was always challenge to balance the resources spent on periodic energy audits versus the potential savings you could achieve with those audits. And the more efficient you become, the more challenging is to get savings at the low cost. So that's a challenge for us and for every any other organization. We also had a lack of visibility on what was plugged into the building and also a limited visibility on how uh, which devices were consuming which uh, uh, the energy so how much energy was consumed by each individual plug load of course we have very limited automation capabilities to manage plug loads even knowing which devices could be managed and there was a lot of redundant equipment like uh, some researchers have three monitors or two computers or as i mentioned before there were two coffee makers at heart with a very low usage ratio also, there were, we still have, and we it's a key component of our operations, a server on site operating 24 seven. 
which represents around 20% of the total energy consumption of the building. And this is non-flexible at all. So that's something that adds up to our base load. We also have another devices that cannot be turned off, like audio devices, video devices in the conference area that would be expensive to resynchronize if they they somehow don't manage to stop communicating, right? So that this discourages also some kind of efficiency work with them. And of course, as any other organization, we need to purchase additional equipment constantly, right? Uh, we hire new people. Uh, for example, there was a power blackout a few months ago, and the IT department decided to buy some small UPSs for desktop computers. Uh, there were 20 UPSs that were bought at that time, consuming 20 watts each. That added 400 watts to our black load base load. And that represents almost 1.5% of our total building consumption. So for highly efficient buildings, small additions to the base load are, are important. Next slide, please. So in this chart, we can see how plug loads have been increasingly important for us. They represented 18.5% in 2018 of the total energy consumption. Uh, they represented 35.76% in 2019, while in the 12 months prior to COVID, our plug loads were responsible of 39% of the total building demand. Next slide, please. And the reason for that is not only that uh, the Energy, uh, energy consumption on plug loads was increasing, but also that we managed to decrease the energy consumption of other energy usages like HVLC or lighting. And I think that's a very particular characteristic of plug loads that is challenging to keep them under control because you always need more, right? You always need additional devices, you hire new people. So it's not like HVAC or lighting. It's, it's, they are way more challenging and we identify that and we recognize that, recognize that very early in the process. Next slide, please. So after we completed this first building uh, energy audit, where we learned way, a lot, a lot about the uh, black loads, we defined uh, different energy efficiency strategies for HART. We put them together, we sit that, sat down, discussed them, and uh, in April 2019, we decided to make a, to celebrate a meeting with all our staff members to present and discuss this the goals we had for the building, the strategies we were going to deploy, and the reason for that. So we, we wanted to our staff members to understand that we were gonna be looking into things that we haven't been looking be into before, like uh, energy consumption at the office level, things like that, uh, just because there is there because there are some goals we want the building to achieve that are strategic for heart. Uh, we want to showcase uh, that some technologies can help any commercial building improve their energy consumption. We are a living lab. We like to test things inside our building. And, and we also have uh, thousands of visitors, have have thousands of visitors since we, since we opened the building. So that's who we are. We are a research company. And many people understood it. Most everybody, almost everybody understood it. There is always some people more reluctant to the strategies when it comes to automating, automating things inside their offices. But in the end, it was a very productive meeting. Next slide, please. After that meeting, we went on deploying strategies. Like for example, uh, in June 2019, we selected and installed a plug load monitoring platform. This, the platform we selected was Sapiens uh, Industries platform. Uh, the process to deploy it was pretty simple. It was self-deployed by our employees. We basically gave them a smart power strip so they could install it in, the, in their office and give us their own power strip. We also gave them a form for them to let us know which devices were plugged in each in each socket of that power strip, and we also configured the power the monitoring platform, uh, just connecting the power stri uh, power strips in each office, just letting know the platform which power strip was connected in each, in each office, so the the power strip could aggregate those consumptions. Uh, this was two years ago. Sapien at that point was a startup. Now they have improved the platform quite a bit. And most of these features are automatic. Like for example, now as you plug what a device on the smart power strips, the platform automatically recognizes the kind of device the, uh, there are, the, the kind of device it is. They also have improved their interface a lot and provide you many different information sources. So there is a quite interesting platform to use. Next slide. 
so once the Sapien platform was installed, uh, we decided to install, a, of course, properly commissioned. We decided to do a follow-up local audit with the using that platform and some uh, and the, uh, some portable meters we already had from the previous energy audit to discover that only six percent of our plug loads were, so to speak, flexible could be somehow modulated because out of the 35% of the plug load uh, of the energy consumed in the building, so 35% of the energy consumed in the building comes from plug loads, but 19% of that 35% goes to the server and the server room and 10% go to the kitchens and other appliances. So we have a high base load. That was one of the conclusions of, uh, of uh, that energy audit. And in 2019, December 2019, we also run uh, partial reconfiguration process, because we also identify many loads that were pretty constant. So for example, the electric panel of the HVAC system is always consuming 200 watts. No matter what you do with the HVAC, it's just the control system. So why should we put a meter to that, right? There is no, doesn't make sense. So we somehow relocated the power strips and the smart meters uh, to cover 100% of our, our variable loads. Next slide, please. Uh, now we're going to discuss a little bit what happened with COVID. As you know, on March 15, 2020, uh, our staff members are encouraged to work from home and the building is closed. Uh, we all work remotely. And with this new way of operating the building, some new challenges arise. Like, for example, we are able to turn off additional equipment in the offices that won't be used in the following months. Also, some appliances in the kitchen areas. Uh, we benefit from plug load savings from staff members working remotely. And at some point, we also need to upgrade the UPS in the server room. And we benefit from that upgrade because the new system is more efficient and uses 150 watts less than the, the previous one. On the other hand, uh, we have more computers that remain on 24 seven and there are other some non-essential devices that need to remain on. So the, the result is the balance you see on the right side of the slide. And there is an error on the legend of that chart, sorry. The orange bars represent weekdays and the blue bars represent weekend days. So pre-COVID, you can see that there is actually a difference between the kilowatt hours consumed in plug loads during weekdays and during weekend days. So we were pretty efficient turning off plug loads and managing them. While during COVID, we are still efficient, but what happened? So we managed to, to switch off the appliances, devices in offices, things that were not going to be used. But at the same time, we had to keep on running, uh, keep on uh, maintain more computers running 24 seven for people to remote into them, to work from home, basically. So you see the difference between uh, the energy consumption, plug load energy consumption in, in a weekday and a weekend day is, 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 is small, it's four kilowatt hours a day. Next slide, please. And just this last slide to talk about for what happened during COVID. So if pre-COVID, you can see in the, in the left side of the slide how our plug load consumption was going up and up and up. And we managed to control that increase for some months using the, the plug load management platform. Still, we kept on adding and more and more devices and the consumption ended up going up until March 2020 where, when COVID hit. And uh, we start managing the loads in a different way. So, and the building was not occupied at all. We were, they were like four people uh, working in the building every day. So our plug load, plug load consumption went down until the beginning of this year in which it got stabilized around, uh, around I think it's uh, 29,500 kilowatt hours a year. And now it's going up as I mentioned before. So the main difference is that uh, if pre-COVID our plug load consumption was uh, around 39% of the total consumption of the building, now it's around 48%. Next slide. And I think Gavin, Gavin Dillingham is gonna let us know now what's next after this COVID situation and what are our, our challenges and goals. Gavin. Hey, great, thank you, Carlos. Thanks everybody. Um, so yeah, as Mustafa and Carlos mentioned, you know we have a very high performance building, and some significant work has been done to really improve the, uh, you know, the, the the efficiency of that building over time. And it's been a lot of really 
strong fine tuning that has allowed us to kind of reach the goals that uh, the team has been able to, to reach here. Um, as we look at what's going to happen to the building within the building after, uh, after COVID here, as we start coming back, um, there's some significant areas we're really thinking about um, to you know, continue to maintain um, the Energy Star rating and the net zero rating for the, for the building here. Um, some of the goals that we're looking at for June 2021 as we start coming back to the building is really making sure we have a good view of you know, what, what that new activity may look like. We have new employees that have started at HARC. We have new equipment. Um, we have new projects. And so we're really gonna have to re refine and reset some of, the, uh, some of the baselines we had established uh, pre-COVID and make sure we have a good feel of how everything's coming online there. Um, as so, some of the things that we're gonna be seeing is, you know, we had the opportunity to turn off a lot of our appliances. Now that people are working, they're gonna to want to drink water and have ice and have coffee and the refrigerator needs to work. So all that stuff needs to be coming back online and working well. Um, and you know, we're gonna also be working in a different dynamic where I think a lot of organizations are seeing this where people are not going to be um, there at the office all the time. They're, they may be there three days of the week. I'm hearing a lot of discussions of hybrid schedules of three days there, two days away. And how does that impact your, your plug load strategies? And so we need to get a better grasp of how that's gonna work as well as we have this, this greater flexibility and this greater mobility in and out of the building and such. So um, anyway, working on some new challenges and new goals uh, as people come back into the, into the organization here. Um, next slide. And the next one here, we're just gonna conclude everything up. Uh, really looking at, you know, what are these challenges in plug load management? Um, as, as many organizations continue to grow and as HARC continues to grow, we're going to see, uh, you know, grow, growing needs of, uh, you know, especially um, computing equipment. We do a lot of um, high powered um, um, data intensive uh, work at HARC. Uh, some of it we use out on the cloud, some of it we keep internally. That discussion of how much do you maintain um, you know, internal versus external, how much that you shop out, how does that, you know, what's the cost benefit analysis associated with that? Um, that's gonna be some significant discussions uh, that we're gonna be have, but really overall is our, is our goal, as everyone's goal that, that does any kind of energy management is to how do, you, how do you minimize those costs as well as maintain operational productivity, operational comfort to make sure people are, you know, have the tools and resources to get the work done. Well, at the same time, not wasting anything and not wasting time and such. And so we think that with the platform that we've put in place with Sapient, um, it allows us to have that visibility, that the ability to manage that plug load and see really and have a better feel of, you know, what, what's happening within the building as well. Um, we, we also see it as, you know, a growing opportunity to try other types of strategies with the building. Um, looking at we've we've had discussions around occupancy sensing and kind of coupling that with other occupancy sensors to see to what degree we can uh, change um, our air conditioning uh, schedules or HVAC schedules around the building and better zone the air, air, the air conditioning schedules there. Um, and so trying to leverage multiple technologies, um, you know, not just using it for plug load management, but also to better understand how to manage our air conditioning systems is going to be a key piece moving forward. Another piece is for anyone that works in the energy management space uh, is really making sure that people that are working in the building understand what's going on and that you're there to, to help help operate that building and make it you know most efficient as possible while at the, not at the same time again trying to reduce their productivity or their efficiency. And so you know working with procurement, working with any any of the purchasing decisions to make sure we're getting the most you know efficient equipment if it's energy star related or you know, that specific standard there that, that's of the highest efficiency. Um, you know, make sure that we're not installing devices that, um, that have to run 24-7. You know, what, what are the performance metrics around those buildings and are there a way to make sure that, you know, we, we can, you know, turn them off and not feel like we have to keep them operating. And a lot of that has to deal with working with the, the IT group, setting the schedule, as Carlos mentioned earlier, to when those updates and push outs are gonna happen. There, so you can have as much technology as you want out there, monitoring your plug load. But if you're not talking to some of those key decision makers on the procurement side, or on the IT uh, IT side, um, you're going to have a lot more a lot more struggles associated with it. And it's also just real easy to kind of get into the weeds as far as defining what's important, what's essential, what's critical. 
you know, you can, you, as you look at the data, you'll, you'll start getting a better feel there. Um, you don't want to push that that too hard. Um, it, it becomes pretty obvious. You can then can just get too lost in minutia where you're spending more time trying to parse this stuff versus actually just managing it there. And then, you know, once we what we've found and what you know it's really you know kind of amazing as you start seeing these different redundancies that are with that are in the that are in buildings, these different you know additional appliances. Maybe you have you know six printers operating up on a floor and you probably could do it with three and you can tie that into your you know your health health and safety benefits uh, within the building by getting people moving up and around and more and such and so once again it's that it's that cultural and communication piece that's important that has to couple along with your with your um, plug load platform the technology there so uh next slide all right, so just some three quick bullet points here to, to point out. Um, once again, plug load management platforms, they're great for energy efficiency tools. Um, they really allow, you know, to get that better visibility, especially as plug load continues to grow um, as, a, as a major consuming resource within the buildings. But once again, I want to emphasize that, um, you know, really you have the plug load platform, but you also need the communications and you need the processes in place to ensure you're bringing in the most efficient equipment and you're, and you're dealing with the redundant equipment as well. Um, you know, there's, there's a trade-off when you're looking at these plug load platforms as far as, you know, how, what's the value of the data, what's the cost of the platform, that cost benefit analysis is going to be key. You can put in some of the sexiest plug load systems out there, but is it real, are you really getting the bang for the buck that you need? And so you need to take a hard look uh, to make sure that um, you know what you're installing in the in the building really you know meets those meets those primary needs, but it's just not you know kind of overbuying what what you need uh, for this particular case. And you know one of the other key pieces here is really making sure that uh, when you're working with the folks that are in the office with you, when you're working with other employees, you know you need to have that that buy-in with them. You need to explain what what's going on and wh why you're trying to reach these goals. And that you're not working at loggerheads together that rather you're trying to figure out ways in which to complement each other's work and you know it's for the ultimate you know for, to meet you know maybe it's to meet esg goals the en environmental social governance goals or greenhouse gas reduction goals and um, you know getting those champions on board that understand that you're not only doing it to save money but there's a lot of other kind of co-benefits associated with with plug load management um, is also a key piece there so um, I think that's it as far as the conclusions in that regard. So I believe we're open for uh, for question and answer. So thank you for everyone for taking some time to listen to us today. Excellent. Thank you very much from the team from HARC for your great presentation. This is a great case study of implementation of um, smart outlet controls for plug-in process for plug loads in a building and how you can achieve zero energy building um, using these controls. So now we're on to the question and answer session. Again, if you have any questions um, for the team from HARC, please type them into your question box. We are compiling them and I will be asking the team questions one by one. If we get to them, um, we'll try to get to as many as possible, but if we don't get to your question, we'll respond um, in an email to everybody on this call. Um, okay, so going into the questions. So I see a few questions that have been highlighted for preference and the rest of the team can highlight some more, but I'm gonna ask the first one on the list. Um, can you comment on your building's resiliency? Were you impacted by the extreme weather events in Texas this spring? I can start off with that question. We were, uh, unfortunately, and some of it was because we, we lost communications before we ever lost power. So, so there's that, that issue, but uh, one of our goals for the building is to add energy storage which allow us to island we don't have that capability right now because we are connected to the grid and while while we produce a lot more power uh, from our solar array than the building consumes it's set up in such a way that if the grid goes down our our, our solar power also goes down and that's mainly to protect the workers out uh, uh you know fixing the down power lines and the substations and so on uh, so, so so by adding energy power storage uh on on site primarily battery we're still looking at at different options and setting up a microgrid, we will significantly increase the resiliency of the building and be able to, to once again island and essentially do our thing regardless of what happens uh, beyond our building boundaries in the grid and, and so on. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Badoon. All right, next question. Are the energy cost reductions taking into account the pandemic and people working from home? 
I think I can take I can take that one. Yeah, of course there are. Uh, we know that the, in a few months we will come back to the post optimization levels, which were around 16 kbtus per square foot. So we know this energy reduction is was due to the pandemic. And uh, the question is, as Gavin highlighted, is that our new base load, or have we how has how has that base load changed in these months? Because We've been installing new devices. We have new people coming, uh, new new hires, new new staff members working for us right now. So this is the our challenge for us: identify our new base load. But yeah, the the numbers we've been showing, of course, show all the evolution through the pandemic. But, but keep in mind, those numbers are still even pre-COVID extremely low. A building with a you know EUI of 15.8 is, is is very efficient. It's just COVID made it more efficient, at least in terms of energy consumption, because there was less use. Excellent. Thanks, Dr. Kamara and Dr. Beydoun. All right, next question. What are some best practices that you have for working with IT? Well, I mean, I'll start and then I, because I, I know that's been a long going discussion between Carlos and me, and some of it is just a conversation and discussion. And some of it was uh, simple stuff as, you know, why does the server room need to be set at 62 degrees when the equipment is rated to operate in 80, 90 degree uh, temperatures? And, and it was it was slowly a gradual process of of turning up the thermostat a degree or two every month, and and now I think our set point seventy two or seventy three, uh, which has saved a significant amount uh, of power, of course, because once again the equipment can still operate efficiently. Sufficiently, it's to talk to them about energy efficiency. Uh, it's talk to talk to them about about looking at the equipment we have and we buy in the future. So, for example, right now everybody in the office has two monitors. But moving forward, when somebody uh, orders new equipment or we have a new employee come to heart, we'll order them one 27 or 32 inch monitor rather than two, you know, 20 inch monitors, uh, which which it makes life easy for, for us from an inventory perspective and equipment perspective, saves us money, but also ends up with a more efficient piece of equipment that does the same work of, of two individual monitors. Uh, we, were, we were also reutilizing uh, all monitors kind of. Uh, having an old monitor as a third monitor, and that's another policy we would like to modify. So not to keep on using and adding monitors to our tables, but being efficient in that regard, as Mustafa mentioned. And, and, and one other thing we are talking to them about, and Carlos highlighted this, with respect to resiliency as well, is, is, is maybe moving some of our data storage and, and software uh, offsite so, so that first they can be accessed more easily remotely by the staff working offsite without having to VPN in. But that would also save us power at the building itself, because once again, it, it's a server or two or three that isn't uh, operating within the building, but, but re rather remotely. Now, now there is a financial cost to that, so we're so we're balancing the, the financial cost with the resilience and 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 and, and power benefits as well. Excellent, thank you. All right, our next question is: Are you aware of the use of energy performance contracts to pay for plug load optimization? Yeah, so um, I've, I've worked in the energy performance contracting space for a, for a while now, and from what we have seen, um, th they have been considered more and more, especially as they've gotten um, more advanced and kind of more integrated into the building operations. Uh, typically, they've been seen more as uh, kind of a, a behavioral cost, not not ne or a behavioral benefit, a behavioral change type benefit versus um necessarily throwing them in there as say like a similar savings as what you'd see from an hvac system or a lighting system or even a, a building automation system and such but they are becoming more uh more part of kind of that overall um like if you're doing an energy performance contract that, that overall uh program there and is seen as providing some deemed savings um to the uh to the project there so yes Excellent. Thanks, Dr. Dillingham. All right, next question. What, if any, occupant education did you facilitate to help occupants learn about the system? Was there any occupant pushback? I mean, and Carlos alluded to this. We did the research, I mean, and we're a sustainability research organization, so uh, we, you know, we have a bias to, to inherently wanting to, to do the right thing in terms of our employees. But 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 it it wasn't necessarily a difficult challenge, but it did take education, and some of it started out by sharing the numbers and and, and our end goals with the with the employees. 
a lot of it was, and I think we did a couple of those sessions. Some of it was follow-up emails. Some of it was one-on-one -on -one discussion. Uh, some of it was was also soliciting their input in terms of uh, opportunities for energy improvement that they uh, could kind of uh, identify themselves. Uh, so, so it was kind of an iterative process with 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 presentations, with with sharing numbers, with with aligning kind of why we were doing this and that with respect to our building end goals and and, and ultimate kind of uh, desires with respect to net zero and uh, and, and uh, you, you know. Energy Star and, and maintaining our, our our LEED Platinum certification, and, and a lot a lot of that work was 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 really led by Carlos and team. Yeah, I would I would say one of the other things that I just found interesting um, was Carlos brought up the coffee makers, which you know yeah. people don't think about. It's a huge thing, but it was it became pretty significant discussion point at Hark, and um, so we had you know it's a two story building, twenty thousand square feet or so. A coffee maker up on top on on bottom and um we were like well we'll just turn up the one on top we'll turn off the one on top on the second floor let people go down to the first floor and get coffee that almost caused a riot because why why do i have to go downstairs to the first floor so the compromise was made well we'll get these vacuum pots and the vacuum pots would bring the coffee from the first floor up to the second floor so you had the, the so you had a you know the one of those vacuum pots upstairs and then the coffee downstairs too and i think that was a nice that was a nice compromise because you know people are like well that, that takes a lot more time to get downstairs or i just don't have you know i don't have that i don't want to go downstairs i want to stay upstairs but in any case it was a nice it's a way to kind of work that that compromise so we knew we needed to get rid of one of those coffee makers because they were redundant and used a huge amount of energy so what's that what's that compromise in this discussion and you know working with the team was like all right vacuum pots and that seemed to be what the solution was there so yeah, and even with the power strips, when when we did set times for certain equipment to turn on and off in offices, uh, there, there's an override button. So, so so if you're working in your office at you know at 7:30 in the evening and the and the monitors go off at six, you you all you have to do is press a button and everything comes back online. So we did kind of give the employees the flexibility to override some of these underlying uh, controls if they needed to use that equipment. And that gave them like an hour. Is that correct? It was a it was a defined moment once again. I can't remember the, the number on that. But. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, next question. What issues did you have with the self-installation of the smart outlet technology? We didn't have any real issues, actually. It was, as I mentioned before, it was self-deployed. We gave each employee a smart power strip to replace the existing power strip. Once they plug it, uh, okay, I, I did the work to pre-configure. No, sorry, they, they came pre-configured with our Wi-Fi user and password from the manufacturer. So it was just plug and play, so to speak. The only thing we have to do is to let the platform know which uh, power strip was installed in each office. And also ask people to let us know what were they connecting in each individual uh, socket. But that was, as I mentioned before, two years ago. Now the platform is able to recognize what you plug in uh, in every socket, and it's, you don't need to, to do that. But we don't have like so. In general, people was happy with not being mm -hmm. concerned about turning off monitors at night and things like that because the platform was doing that for them. So I, I in our case, it was it was it was easy. It went well. Yeah, and I know there was a question about the cost of the power strips. Do you remember how much we're paying? And, and we're leasing them right now, by the way. So we didn't end up buying them. So, so we have a monthly payment that we we provide Sapient and yeah, like this, bucks this a month list, or something like that, or I can't, I can't remember. It's the leasing contract we have with Sapient, but I wouldn't like to release that since that's their their, their business, their, their business, right? There is, is, so it's yeah, we pay a monthly fee for, uh, for the leasing of the power strips and the usage of the platform. That's the, the business structure. Excellent. Um, another question. I think we know the answer, but I want to ask it um, anyway. What dashboard? What dashboard software platform are you using? Uh, that, those our internal dashboards were developed by by our own staff members. Uh, we use Grafana with some data collected internally, and basically that's how we we set up the internal dashboards. Excellent, thanks. Do we, do we use Raspberry Pi on this? Is that with the... Yeah, so we are collecting some data with some Raspberry Pis from different meters, yeah. yeah and we did run a, across some issues with, with collecting data from some of our sub meters, which I know we, 
is, is a common issue with talking to other building owners. Uh, they weren't configured to be able to connect with our building automation system because the builder ended up ordering the wrong whatever uh, backnet, this or that, and, and what have you. And, and then they wanted like $5,000 to, 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 to allow us to get that software to be able to connect to the system that they installed. So we ended up finding a workaround and doing it ourselves, quite honestly. But, but it was really our, our research that developed both the, uh, the public dashboard, which, which we showed you a picture of, but also the internal, more, more detailed dashboard. Excellent, thank you. And actually, I wasn't expecting that answer, so I'm glad I asked that question. Yeah. Um, I think I have time for one more question, so I'm going to ask um, this one. What types of meters did you use during the metering phase? We used some portable meters. So we, first, we used the, the plug loads of meter, right, as the as the aggregated meter for every plug load. But you, we use some meters called IoT a watt, which have I think 14 channels, so you can measure 14 energy consumption so at the same time at the circuit breaker level are, uh, are really nice meters and they are inexpensive. So it's, those are good meters too for energy audits. And then we, had, then we had the EMON DEMON meters and those gave us uh, aggregate data for everything HVAC, everything lighting, uh, everything plug and, and then our elevator as well. And then of course there were the sapient meters that we also looked at. Yeah. And, and the beauty of the internal dashboard is it allows us to bring everything into one place. Where with the building automation system, we're, we're confined to just looking at the EPO and DEMON meters. Excellent. Thank you. Well, that's all the time that we have for question and answer. Um, we'll respond to the other questions in an email. Um, next slide, please. So at this time, I want to give the opportunity to anyone who would like to provide an update in your update. So if you if you want to provide an update, please raise your hand. I'm going to look over here at the screen to see if I see any hands. Um, and, um, in the, we, I always like to provide opportunities for members to um, give an update. Um, these don't have to be necessarily what you're doing for plug loads. It could be what you're thinking about doing for plug loads or what questions or um, challenges you've noticed that you have um, on plug load control. Don't see any hands. Um, one more check here. Oh, I see Wyatt Merrill has his hand up. Um, so can we open Wyatt's mic? Hey, can you hear me? Yes, hi Wyatt. Hi, I probably sound like a broken record with this group, but I just wanted to say uh, once again that we are continuing work on a multi-year uh, strategy around uh, miscellaneous electric loads in particular from an R&D perspective. Uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm with the Building Technologies Office and the Emerging Technologies Program, and this is part of a new portfolio that we have there. So if there's anyone on the call that wants to chat more about that, please feel free to reach out to me and we can set up some time to talk about uh, what you would like to see in an R&D portfolio for miscellaneous electric loads, uh, which of course includes many, many plug loads. Thank you, Wyatt. And can you remind everyone of your email um, and what your portfolio is called? Yes, um, we actually are in the process of setting up a web page, so you won't find too much information online. Um, it, it's a it's a new portfolio, which is part of the reason I'm soliciting some uh, stakeholder engagement here. We we really need to be in touch with as many people as we can. Uh, my email is my first name dot my last name, which is Wyatt W Y A T T dot Merrill M E R R I L L at e e dot d o e dot gov. Um, you should be able to find, if you Google my name, you should be able to find my email that way through the BTO website. The portfolio is is called BEADS, or Building uh, Electric Appliances, Devices, and Systems. So this is, the MELS uh, component is a big component of that portfolio. Thank you for the time. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, next slide. And we're wrapping up here. Um, um, Dr. Wyatt Merrill, I'd love to hear from you, as would we. So if you have any um, thoughts on your um, successes for PPL strategies or challenges, please email us at ppl at nrel.gov. Visit our website. Um, it's down there on the on the last green line. 
And with that, the top of the hour, next slide. I wanna thank all of you for joining and I'll see you at our next um, BBA PPL technology team webinar. Thank you all and have a great week.